geometry proofs can feel impossible. You stare at the given and the proof on the page and just think, how am I supposed to fill in the middle? The truth is, every single proof follows the same simple pattern, and by the end of the video, you'll know the exact system to plan and solve a proof like this one with confidence. This is your definitive guide, so let's get started. What even is the structure of a proof? Well, let's talk anatomy. Most proofs are two-column proofs, where we label the left column as statements and the right column as reasons. Everything that we put on the left is what we know, and everything we put on the right is how we know it. So for every statement you make about what you know, you must give a corresponding reason for how you know it. You can't make a statement without a valid reason. This is the entire game. Before we write a single proof, we're gonna talk about four foundational rules that are gonna save us from the most common mistakes. So these are also pitfalls that we need to look out for. First is this idea of equality versus congruence. It's really common to make this mistake when we write proofs. What we need to know is that we use equality, we use an equal sign when we're talking about measures of things, so the degree measure of an angle or the length of a line segment, but we use congruence when we talk about objects. So to say that two triangles are congruent means they have three equal angle measures and three sets of proportional side lengths. So we might say, for example, that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF because we're talking about triangles and those are objects, so we use congruence. Whereas we might say that the measure of angle A is equal to the measure of angle D because here we're talking about measures, so we use equality. The second rule is specifically the definition of congruence. This is the rule that lets us switch between objects and their measures. So for example, if we know two line segments are congruent, we can say that their lengths are equal. So we have that legal bridge to move back and forth between congruence and equality. The third, and this one's really critical, is that a picture, a diagram, is not necessarily equal to evidence. In other words, we never assume something from a picture or from a diagram that isn't specifically told to us or that we can't explicitly prove. For instance, if we're given this triangle ABC, it looks from this picture like the triangle might be equilateral. These three side lengths look like they're roughly of equal length. But we can't just assume that the triangle is equilateral, even if it looks like it is. We would specifically have to be given these hash marks that indicate that all three sides have equal length in order to know that the triangle is equilateral. Without them, we would just be assuming by the way ABC looks that it's equilateral, and we definitely cannot do that. And then the last foundational rule and a common pitfall is that transitivity is not substitution. It's really easy to mix these up. For example, if we know that the segments AB and CD have equal length and CD and EF have equal length, then by the transitive property, we could say that therefore AB has to be equal to EF. In other words, when we use the transitive property, we make a new equation from two other equations we've been given. Because AB is equal to CD and CD is equal to EF, we can conclude that AB has to be equal to EF. We build a new equation from two others. Substitution, on the other hand, is where we replace some quantity with an equal quantity inside an existing statement. So if we knew that AB was equal to 2x plus 1 and CD was equal to 3x minus 6, then we could substitute those two values into AB equals CD into that equation to get this equation here. In other words, we didn't use the idea of a chain to create a third equation from two other equations. Instead, we substituted values into one equation, replacing them in place. We have to use the right name for the action that we're doing in our proof. Now, remember before when we looked at a two column proof, we said that for every statement, we had to give a reason. Well, there are all different kinds of reasons that we'll use in our proofs. The first one we'll always use is that information has been given. We can make a statement in our proof and justify it with the reason that the information was given to us in the problem statement. It's the information we already have. But we will also use definitions, for example, the definition of a midpoint or the definition of an angle bisector. We will use postulates like the segment addition postulate. We'll also use theorems like the vertical angles theorem and properties of equality like the substitution property of equality or the addition or subtraction properties of equality. We'll use a lot of these to justify our algebraic simplification in our proofs. And then finally, the bridge that we talked about earlier where we can move back and forth between congruence and equality and we'll use reasons like the definition of congruent segments or the definition of congruent angles. These are the categories of reasons that we'll be using. These can be a lot to remember, but as we do lots of these proof practice problems, we'll get more comfortable remembering these different reasons and we'll start to see patterns about the reasons that we use over and over again. 
that brings us to one of the biggest problems when you write proofs, which is how do you know what to write next? Well, it can often be helpful to start with what we're trying to prove and work backwards. If you start with the goal of the proof and then you think to yourself, what would need to be true just before this? And you keep working backwards with that same question, what would need to be true just before that until eventually you get back to the given information. That's called a goal tree and it can really help you visualize where you need to go. Sometimes you can start with the given information and work your way through chronologically, thinking about the next step and the next step and the next step until you get to what you need to prove but it can also be helpful to work backwards. So when you're approaching a proof, think about both directions. Start with the given information and try to chip away at working toward what you're trying to prove, but also start with what you're trying to prove and think about how you might work backwards. Sometimes using both approaches can help you figure out how you're gonna meet those two directions and build out the middle of the proof. So now that we kind of know the anatomy of a proof and we've seen some reasons we can use to justify our statements and we've talked a little bit about a plan of action for a proof, let's do a little practice proof with something we already know. If you're in geometry, you've already taken some algebra. So let's just make this an algebra proof. Let's say that we're given that 3x plus 10 is equal to 22 and we're asked to prove that x equals 4. That's always the format of a proof. We have given information and we've been told what we're trying to prove. So to put this in proof format, we build a two column proof with statements on the left and reasons on the right. And in this format, we always, 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 100% of the time, start with the information we've been given. So we've been told that 3x plus 10 equals 22. That's going to be our statement. The reason for that statement is given. That information was given to us. We don't need to say anything more than that. Now we're trying to work our way step by step to x equals 4. Well, this is an algebra problem, so we already know how to solve it. We know that our next statement needs to be 3x equal to 12 when we subtract 10 from both sides. Well, because we're doing subtraction there, the reason for this next statement is just the subtraction property of equality. In other words, when we have an equality, when we have an equation, we can subtract the same value from both sides. That's the subtraction property of equality. And then to solve for x, we just divide through by three to get x equal to four, that's the division property of equality in the same way. And on our statement side, we've gotten down to x equal to four, which is exactly what we were asked to prove. So our proof is done and it was only a three line proof, the information we were given and then two steps to find what we were asked to prove. It's just a careful step-by-step -step argument planned in advance. So we're really comfortable with algebra, but now let's apply this to geometry and see if things get any tougher. We're going to continue to build our toolkit with a few quick micro proofs. So let's start with a segment addition proof. Here, we've been given this information that point B is on the line segment, AC, and we've been told that the length of AB is 5 and the length of BC is 7. So we have these two segment lengths. We've been asked to prove that the length of segment AC is 12. So as always, We'll start with our two column proof and our given information. So we compile what we've been given, we state that under statements, and then the reason for that is that it's given. And then if point B is on segment AC, we can imagine here a segment AC and some point B that sits somewhere on the segment. We've been told that the length of AB is 5, so this length here, and BC has a length of 7, and we need to prove that the length of the entire segment AC is 12. Well, that means that our next step is to say that the sum of the lengths of AB and BC is equal to the length of AC. That is the segment addition postulate. So we make that statement, then we can substitute the values for AB and BC. We were given those lengths because all we're doing is substituting. The reason there or the justification is the substitution property of equality. And then with simplification, 5 plus 7, we get 12. We can say that the length of AC is 12, which of course is what we were asked to prove. So this was a four-step proof of this segment addition postulate. What about a simple midpoint proof if we're told that M is the midpoint of segment LN and we've been asked to prove that LM is congruent to MN? Well, we set up our two column proof as always, we give our given information, and then there's really only one more step. We say that LM is congruent to MN by the definition of a midpoint. Because we were told that M was the midpoint of LN, we know that M divides LN perfectly in half, creating two congruent segments, LM and MN. By the definition of a midpoint, when we already know M is the midpoint, this statement has to be true. In other words, what we're doing here with these simple proofs is proving these basic geometry concepts. 
the segment addition postulate, the definition of a midpoint, etc. We could also look at one with angles, and we've been given this diagram showing ray BD perfectly bisecting angle ABC. So our two column proof, of course, starts with the given information, and then we only need two steps. The definition of an angle bisector is that it creates two smaller congruent angles. So the fact that BD bisects ABC means, by definition, that ABD has to be an equal angle to DBC. So we can say that these two angles are congruent by the definition of an angle bisector, given that BD is a bisector of ABC. And then here's our bridge that we looked at before, the bridge between congruence and equality. Because these two angles are congruent, they are objects, so we have to say they're congruent, then we can say that their measures are equal. So we switch from the angles, the objects, to the measures of those angles, and we can say that they are equal. That's by the definition of congruent angles, because in the last statement, we had congruent angles, and by that definition, we can say that the measures of those congruent angles are equal. One last simple one before we go back to complete the proof that we started this video with. And in this one, we've been told that segment AD is perpendicular to segment BC. So we see AD here perpendicular to BC. We need to prove that the sum of these two angle measures is 180 degrees. And so in our two column proof, we start as always with the information we've been given. Then our next step is to say that the two angles ABD and DBC form a linear pair, and that's the definition of a linear pair. And then because we know that that's true, and we know that linear pairs are supplementary by the linear pair theorem, meaning that they sum to 180 degrees, we can draw the conclusion that the measures of the two angles have to equal 180 degrees by the definition of supplementary angles. So with a couple of these basic proofs under our belt, let's return to the problem we started with at the very beginning of this video. And we were told that the lengths of these two segments, AB and BC, can be defined by 2x minus 1 and x plus 4, respectively, and asked to prove that x is equal to 5. So how do we pull all of our tools together? Well, we know that we're starting with a two-column proof. We know we're going to have two columns, one for statements, one for reasons. And the first statement is going to be all the information we were given. The reason for that is going to be given. So after this first statement, what can be our next step? Well, if B is the midpoint of AC, then we know that AC gets split perfectly in half by B by the definition of a midpoint. Therefore, AB has to be congruent to BC. We looked at this earlier when we looked at a proof for the definition of a midpoint. Now, here's our bridge where we move from congruence to equality. Because we have congruent segments, we know that their lengths have to be equal by the definition of congruent segments. And then, because we already have the measures of A, B, and B, C, we can substitute those values, 2x minus 1 and x plus 4, into the equality by the substitution property of equality. And then the rest is just going to be algebra, meaning that we're going to use all of our different properties of equality. We'll first subtract x from both sides to get x minus 1 equal to 4, because we did subtraction the justification here, the reason, is the subtraction property of equality. And then we'll add 1 to both sides to get x equal to 5. And because we added, it's the addition property of equality that we give as our reason. And so in six steps, we were able to get to what we were trying to prove using a two-column proof. We can also look at the same proof as a flowchart instead of as a two-column proof. Notice our same three pieces of information that we were given. We always put those at the top and then we make a flowchart. So our next statement is that AB has to be congruent to BC, which comes directly from the fact that B is the midpoint of AC and the definition of a midpoint, which is that it cuts a segment exactly in half, therefore creating two congruent segments, AB and BC, have to be exactly equal in length they are congruent to one another. That comes only from this piece of given information. We didn't need these two other pieces in order to make this statement, which is why we indicate with this arrow that it only comes from this statement, that B is the midpoint of AC. But then our next step is to substitute these two values into this congruent statement. So all three of these feed into our next statement. And by the substitution property of equality, we can say that 2x minus 1 has to be equal to x plus 4. And then from there, the rest is algebra. We get x minus 1 equals 4 by the subtraction property and x equal to 5 by the addition property. Same exact proof we looked at before, just presented in a different format. So we have the two-column format, the flowchart format, and then the paragraph format. 
which is exactly what the name implies, where we just write the proof in paragraph form. If we were to do that with this proof that we've been looking at throughout the video, it would go something like this. We would say that we're given that B is the midpoint of AC. So there's our reason. This is the statement that goes along with it. Then we say, by the definition of a midpoint, we know that AB has to be congruent to BC. That's our statement and our reason. Then, by substitution, because AB is 2x minus 1 and BC is x plus 4, we know it has to be true that 2x minus 1 is equal to x plus 4. Then, we find that x minus 1 equals 4 by the subtraction property of equality. And finally, we arrive at our conclusion that x equals 5 by the addition property of equality. So you can see that all we're doing is pairing together a statement and a reason, one in each sentence, and stringing those together to create a paragraph proof. So the real takeaway here is that proofs aren't just about geometry. They train you to think methodically. We now know how to identify our given statements and our proof statements. We know how to set up a two-column proof and translate that into a flowchart proof and a paragraph proof. We understand the difference between statements and reasons, and we're starting to build out a big bank of reasons that we can draw on as we continue practicing these proofs. And we've even covered pitfalls we should look out for so that we don't make some of the most common mistakes when we're writing proofs like these ones. And if you wanna go even deeper with proofs, make sure to check out my geometry course linked down below.